I'm honored. I mean, really, really honored to be able to introduce our speaker to you. You know, the word says sometimes we entertain angels unaware. And I think in this case, we have among us an angel and we just weren't aware of it. So guess who has been included in Who's Who in Black Atlanta since 2005? Guess who? <laughs> guess who attended Jackson Theological Seminary where she earned, not bought, a Master of Religious Arts in Biblical Studies? Guess who? in 1999, earned a doctorate of ministry in Christian education in 2006. Guess who that angel is? Let me tell you a little bit about her. She is indeed the Proverbs 31, 31 woman. We often hear about the other verses, but we rarely hear anybody get to the end. And I like to speak to somebody who is accomplished. The last verse says, Give her of the fruit of her hands and let her own works praise her in the gates. Hallelujah. Our speaker today has great works as well as an intimate relationship with the Lord. She's a mother, a grandmother of seven, a very successful businesswoman, a teacher, a preacher, a thought leader. Think about those things. Most of us would be happy to have any one of those, any one of those. And yet, those of us who know her know how humble she is, how kind she is, how thoughtful and unassuming she is. And maybe she's not so unassuming. Maybe she's praying for you, like she's prayed for me. Her ministry focus has been one of studying and teaching the gospel from a practical standpoint so that lives are changed People are empowered, and souls are one to Jesus Christ. She's a mortgage banker. She's a real estate executive. But most of us go to work and just do the job till we can get home. But she's made her job a ministry. Yes. She ministers to our community. Those of you who know me know how the beloved community is in my heart. And she gets people homes. She gets them a stake in our economy, a stake in leadership for their families. She is our angel. Dr. Murray partners with churches and other nonprofit groups to deliver financial literacy training. Most of us learn how to read books, but we didn't learn how to read balance sheets. We didn't learn how to manage our money. We learned how to spend it. But this angel, teaches us how to manage that. Yes. Prior to coming to Georgia, she lived in Northern California. She was born in Oakland. She was <laughs> a pastor's daughter and a Bible-loving, teaching, preaching sister. For many years, she worked in various capacities in the north central jurisdiction of the Church of God in Christ, where her brother, Dr. D.R. Murray, is the jurisdictional prelate. And I believe he's also the bishop now, am I correct? Yes. So within south central Georgia jurisdiction, Dr. Murray is a member of Kelly Lake Church of God in Christ. She's a proud and blessed mother of one daughter, Mrs. Tiffany Moss, our own songbird, Tiffany <laughs> Tiffany. <laughs> she has a son, Jerome Romeo Clifton, who have preceded us to heaven, and seven wonderful grandchildren. Jeremiah 29 and 11 says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. And over and over and over, my friend, our angel, today's speaker, Dr. Regina Murray, brings us hope of a future. God bless you.
may be seated. Y'all praying, right? <laughs> Father God, we thank you so much for this opportunity to share your word for your people. We ask that you anoint the word, bless the hearers of the word, let me decrease so that you may increase. We ask your blessings over this service. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. Wow, was that me? You were talking about yeah. Dr. Valti? <laughs> well, do you all know what today is? Today is International Women's Day. So that women's anointing that he spoke of is real. It's real. It's in the atmosphere. So the timing for today is perfect. So as many of you know, I love history. I love culture. And I love to intertwine it with the word of God. And so my introduction today will share a little bit about Women's History Month, March. Amen. The Library of Congress and the National Archives and Records Administration, the National Endowment for the Humanities, the National Park Service, the Smithsonian Institute, and the United States Holocaust Museum all join this month in paying tribute to women. Amen. Women's History Month had its origin as a national celebration in 1981 when Congress authorized and requested the president to proclaim this week Women's History Week. <laughs> Women, give yourselves a hand. Yes, then in 1987, after being petitioned by the National Women's History Project, Congress passed a publication for the entire month of March, Women's History Month. Between 1988 and 1994, Congress passed additional resolutions. Since 1995, Presidents Clinton, Bush, and Obama have issued a series of annual proclamations designating the month of March as Women's History Month. So, again, today, March 8, 2020, is International Women's Day across the world. Across the world. And so let me just say up front, when we empower and encourage women, that by no means demeans men. Give the men a hand. We appreciate them. So here's a little International Women's Day trivia. Some of you may already know this. On October 24, 1975, 90% of the Icelandic women went on strike refusing to do any work at their homes or their jobs. It was the largest demonstration in the nation's history and it shut down the entire country of Iceland. The airports were closed, the schools were closed, the hospitals couldn't function. The strike had an immediate and lasting impact. Amen. Look at that. The following year, Iceland's parliament, which was now, or in 1975, half women, passed a law guaranteeing women equal pay and paid maternity leave. Yeah. Four years later, Iceland elected the world's first female president. And today, Iceland has the highest gender equality in the world. Yeah. All right. The audacity of neglected voices to speak up, the nerve of desperate women to seek help, that's just like a woman. Have y'all heard that saying before, that's just like a woman? Sometimes, sometimes when that is said, it is not a compliment. But I have a feeling that by the time we get to the end of this message today, and throughout the message today, y'all going to be saying, that's just like a woman. Right? That's just like a woman. It reminds me of the snowflake. One snowflake is considered so cute delicate, fragile, harmless, right? Yes. But put hundreds of thousands of snowflakes together and they can shut down a large city like Boston, New York, Chicago, and especially Atlanta, right? <laughs> so as women working together with a common focus on one accord, we can make it happen. Yes. Deuteronomy 32:30 and Leviticus 26 and 8 says one can chase a thousand. And two can put 10,000 to flight. How many women are in here? Hallelujah. So if my math serves me correctly, we got some power. Yeah. We can do some things. 
So speaking of culture and holidays, has anyone ever heard of the Festival of Purim? Okay. Purim is a spring holiday or a public festival that commemorates the Jewish nation's narrow escape from collective destruction. Yes. It's also known as a celebration of deliverance. Yes. It's a festival to celebrate the salvation of the Jewish people in ancient Persia yes. from Haman's plot right. to destroy, kill, and annihilate all of the Jews. Mm. Anybody remember that story? Yes. Purim is usually held over two days on the 14th and 15th of Adar, the 12th month of the Jewish calendar that usually falls in March. In 2020, March 9th and 10th, tomorrow, Monday and Tuesday, the Purim Festival will be going on. <laughs> Guess who's responsible for this holiday that has been celebrated for thousands of years? Guess who? The Book of Esther recounts the Purim story. And it is read the night before the celebrations began after a day-long fast and also, during the following morning, there's noise and stomping and booing and hissing. Everyone is encouraged to do that whenever Haman's name is mentioned. When Mordecai's name is mentioned, there's loud cheering. Parties are held with lots of dancing, singing, drinking, and eating. A huge feast is prepared. In today's vernacular, they turn up, <laughs> for real. <laughs> So to this day, the Jews still celebrate this deliverance, and they still call a fast before the celebration. It is known as the fast of Esther. They have not forgotten the key role that Esther played in their nation's deliverance. So let's take a look at our theme scripture. If you have your Bibles, you can turn to Esther 4 and 14. And the New Living Translation, if you keep quiet at a time like this, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place, but you and your father's house will perish. You were made for such a time as this. Our theme is sort of twofold. Women built for such a time as this. Now, you all were born for such a time as this, right? And the second, the subtitle to our sermon that's just like a woman. Y'all like that? For such a time as this. Today we focus on Esther, an orphan girl turned queen who risked her life for her people. And so when it comes to exegeting the scripture or preparing a lesson from the Bible, in order to paint the picture properly, it is vital to first take a look at the times, the culture, the climate, and the mindset in which the setting takes place. You never want to assume that everyone in your audience knows the story. So in Leviticus, when you have time to read Leviticus 27, verses 1 through 7, it tells about the value of a male versus a female during that time. And needless to say, throughout history and in Old Testament biblical times, and even today, we find that a woman's worth, value, and appreciation, sometimes it leaves much to be desired. Amen? Amen. The book of Esther, how many of you have read it? The book of Esther. It reads like a ready, like a made for television movie. It has suspense, intrigue, betrayal, conspiracy, and treachery. However, what we discover is that this is not merely a story of ancient past, but it's also divinely inspired, magnificently accurate. It's a portrayal of God's active hand in human history. It's an example of kingdom principles at work. And so as we read the Bible, it reveals that God intervenes in human history in two distinct ways. He sometimes does supernatural or beyond the natural deeds that only he can do. Three examples of this type of divine intervention are the parting of the Red Sea, Amen. God's feeding of Israel in the wilderness with manna for 40 years, yeah. and Jesus feeding 5,000 from a Happy Meal. Yeah. At other times, God uses people and objects within his creation. Like a great puppet master, he orchestrates and directs people you, to fulfill his will. Yes. These activities by God are even more numerous than the supernatural miracles. Examples of this other type of intervention are found in Joseph's sale into slavery and his, his eventual use by God to save Israel from starvation. David's slain of Goliath and Caesar's decree that forced Joseph to take Mary to Bethlehem forced Joseph to take Mary to Bethlehem 
to fulfill the prophecy that the Messiah would be born in that city yes. and not somewhere else. Yes. Right? Yes. Amen. So the story of Esther, I, I love it, and every time I read it, I get something new out of it. The story of Esther, interesting thing is that God's name is never mentioned in the entire book of Esther. But God's guiding hand can be seen throughout it. In the book of Esther, there are five major characters. A king, a queen, an orphan girl, a man of God, and a villain. The king is Xerxes, son of King Darius. The first act in this story centers on a fundraising party with hundreds of dignitaries from all over the empire bringing tribute to finance a war with Greece. Now, this was one of those $100,000 play dinners, right, for King Xerxes. And so at the end of this party, with his judgment impaired by alcohol, Xerxes made a foolish and arrogant decision to show off his beautiful wife to all of his guests. Now, all of his guests were men. The women had a separate party going on at the same time, given by Vashti, the queen. But it was nowhere near as elaborate as what the men had going on. So Xerxes ordered her, his wife, Vashti, to parade in front of his guests. He wanted everyone to know what he had and how he controlled her. Vashti refused. I'm sure the king, as well as some of the guests in attendance, were shaking their heads and saying, that's just like a woman, <laughs> not to show up. Vashti was stunned, but she refused. She had standards, and she refused to lower herself to that level. Yes. Esther 1 and 12 says, this made the king furious and he burned with anger. So back to the culture and the climate of Persia. Persia of that day was much like the Arab countries of today. The husband had complete control over the wife. Women were abused regularly. And so Vashti's refusal was considered scandalous. It was a rebellion against an oppressive system that degraded women. She was basically just standing up for the dignity of women everywhere. She had the courage to say no. But what happened to her? She was deposed as queen. She was taken down. Some commentators think she was executed based upon Esther's statement in Esther 4.16, where she said, though it is against the law, I will go in to see the king. And if I die, I am willing to die. For Esther to make this statement, there had to have been a prior example of that taking place. So here we are in our story. The curtain opens to act two of this drama. Between chapter one and chapter two of the book of Esther, four years have passed. Chapter two finds Xerxes back in his palace, licking his wounds. He lost the war, raised all that money, but lost the war, feeling lonely. He missed Vashti's company. His attendants sensed his loneliness and suggested a beauty pageant to find him a new wife. Let us search the empire to find a beautiful young virgin for the king, a young woman who pleases you will be made queen instead of Vashti. That's in Esther 2 and 4. Xerxes liked the idea. One of the women chosen was Esther. Who was this Esther, and why was she chosen? When Esther was a minor, her father and mother died. So here she was, just a teenager and an orphan. Now, it's quiet in here. If y'all want to say amen or something amen. or something. <laughs> I don't want to feel like I'm in here by myself. But <laughs> she was an orphan, right? Her older cousin, Mordecai, adopted her into his family and raised her as his own daughter. From scriptural evidence, they seemed to have a deep and trusting relationship towards one another. Mordecai did what he believed was best for Esther, and Esther listened to Mordecai's wisdom and direction. When the king's servants arrived in Susa, Esther's city of residence, they were impressed with her beauty and chose her as a candidate for Xerxes' special affection. But keep in mind, Esther was still just one of many beautiful girls at this point. As with the other women that were chosen, Esther was taken to a special place and given one year's worth of beauty treatments. Right? A 12-month <laughs> extreme makeover. Not that one-hour show, Extreme Makeover, you see this in the beginning and that in an hour later. She received six months of oil and myrrh, followed by six months of special perfume and ointments. Anybody can use that. <laughs> now, here is where the favor kicks in. While in the harem, 
Esther was coached and mentored by the best, Haggai, who was the eunuch in charge of the entire harem of women. The scripture that says, the scripture says rather that he, Haggai, was very impressed with Esther and he treated her kindly. Y'all see this pattern? Favor, favor, favor? He ordered her a special menu of health foods. Green smoothies. We got any vegans in here? <laughs> Fresh juice, freshly juiced fruit, organic veggies, grain-fed chickens, and grass-fed beef. All of this to enhance her appearance and her vitality. He gave Esther extra beauty treatments. He assigned seven maids to her to be her personal assistants. And he gave Esther a room with a view. The best location in the harem favor. Fast forward one year later. In Esther 2, 15 through 18, we see what happened when Esther is called forth to see the king. But before going in to see the king, she sought and accepted the advice of Haggai, the eunuch in charge of the harem. She asked for nothing but what he suggested. She followed his lead, and she was admired by everyone who saw her. So ask yourself, who are you allowing to mentor you? Whose advice are you receiving? Iron sharpens iron, right? Who do you have in your circle of confidants and advisors? When Esther was taken to King Xerxes at the uh, royal palace in the early winter of the seventh year of his reign, the king loved her more than any of the other young women, more favor. He was so delighted with her that he set the royal crown on her head and declared her queen instead of Vashti. So here we have a little orphan girl who was now the queen of Persia. Yes. Wow. And because of Esther's influence, Mordecai was given a position as a palace official. How many of you know that your elevation takes others with you? Come on, man. Did you hear? Come on. When God blesses you, he blesses those connected to you. Yes. Yes. One day, Mordecai overheard two of the palace guards plotting to assassinate Xerxes. He reported what he heard to Esther, and she took the information to the king. King, Xer king Xerxes vetted the information and found out that it was not fake news. Amen. It was true. Amen. Needless to say, the two men were executed. But time went on, and it was soon forgotten what Mordecai had done. Now, he saved the king's life, but yes. time went on. He received no award. But how many know God does not forget? Amen. God does not forget. Amen. In the meantime, we have that evil person, Haman, who was a prime minister and he enjoyed prominence in the king's sight. The king ordered everyone to bow down before Haman whenever he passed by. Mordecai refused to do this, despite repeated counsel to do it. Haman was incensed at Mordecai's snub. He was very angry. Haman also was a well-known hater of all of the Jews. This incident with Mordecai provoked him to such anger that he committed himself to destroy all the Jews in the kingdom. Every single one, pure evil, because of one man's refusal to bow, he wanted to wipe out all of the Jews. Wow. With that being said, Haman made elaborate plans for nearly a year. He was focused on destroying the Jews. Almost a full year, he plotted this mass genocide. He was consumed with his idea and consumed with anger. And as an added incentive to motivate others to kill the Jews, the property of the Jew killed would be given to the killer. Official decrees were written and distributed throughout the kingdom. You kill this Jew, you get everything he has. You kill that Jew, you get his whole family. They wanted to wipe out the Jews, or Haman wanted to wipe out the Jews. When Mordecai learned of the plot, he became very distraught, very upset. Jews all over the kingdom were fearful and confused. And as news of the king's decree reached all over the provinces, there was great mourning among the Jews. They fasted, they wept, they wailed, they cried, and many lay in sackcloth and ashes. Can you imagine the heaviness that covered the land? That scripture is uh, Esther 4 and 3, details the heaviness, the sadness that covered the land. So Mordecai, now an official at the palace, he also covered himself in sackcloth and ashes to mourn for his people. Esther, the queen, she has no idea what is going on. She's clueless. She's separated. Also, she had no idea what the situation was when she saw Mordecai mourning. She didn't know why her cousin was so sad. So she sent her servant to inquire as to the reason for his extreme sadness. Mordecai gave the servant a copy of the decree 
The servant gave it to Esther. Mordecai asked Esther to take it to the king and intercede on behalf of her people. But Esther reminded Mordecai, it's illegal upon penalty of death for anyone, even me, to appear before the king uninvited. Furthermore, she hadn't seen the king in 30 days. She couldn't just go barging in there. <laughs> Mordecai's response to Esther shows the severity of the situation as well as his belief that God will not allow all Jews to perish. He must, he must have believed in the promises made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Yeah. But at the same time, knowing that this is a real possibility, right. that myself, the entire town of Susa, and Esther, we're doomed to die unless something changes. But Esther, my dear daughter, excuse me, don't forget, you too are a Jew. You are not exempt from this decree. These are your people. So this was a real wake-up call for Esther. She took a mental step back, and she began to focus on the reality of what they were facing. She knew it was going to take God and God alone to fix this. Esther saw the truth of what Mordecai said and sent the following message to him. Go gather together all of the Jews of Susa and fast for me. Yes. How many of you know sometimes you need a spiritual backup when you're facing yeah. challenges, right? You need a prayer partner. Yeah. Esther said, do not eat, don't drink for three days, neither day, Mordecai. I need you all to call all the Jews together and fast and pray. So the weight of the entire nation was now on the shoulders of the little orphan girl turned queen. Yeah. Esther said, my maids and I, my seven attendants, we're going to do the same thing. We're going to fast and pray. And then Esther added, though it is against the law, again, I will go in to see the king. If I must die, I am willing to die. Yes. She was willing to risk her position as queen. Yes. She was willing to risk her life. She was willing to give up her future. She was willing to burn her bridges. Yes. Now, Esther wasn't an aggressive person by nature. All of her life, she had been graciously submissive. First to Mordecai as her adoptive father, and now to Xerxes the king. She respected laws and proper submission, and she was probably the direct opposite of Vashti, who was very aggressive in her responses. But now, at a critical time, at a such time as this, she let her responsibility to her people push her to do what she never would have considered doing previously, yeah, yeah, yeah. approaching the king uninvited, putting her life in jeopardy. But she was not irrational in her actions or behaviors. She said, first, I'm going to fast and pray, and then I'm going to see the king. So three days later, after fasting and praying, Esther appeared before the king and received a warm welcome. What? She received a warm welcome. The king invited her in. Part one of Esther's prayer was answered. He didn't kill her. Favor. Instead, Xerxes asked her, what is your request? I will give it to you. Even if it is half of the kingdom. Right? That's that's in Esther five and three. Yes, God. Thank you, Jesus. Wow. Just like that. Amen. Now think about this. At this point, Esther could have had wealth beyond her wildest dreams. Yes, yes. She could have forgotten about her people, yes. about Mordecai, and about God. Yes. But she did not. She remained faithful. She had one request. Now, he offered her half of the kingdom. She had one request. She simply asked that the king allow her to arrange a special banquet for, just for them, the king, the queen, and Haman. Now, y'all remember who Haman was, right? Her request was granted. More favor. Look at the wisdom that this young lady possessed. She didn't rush into part two of her request just yet. She said nothing about the killing of the Jews. She just wanted to be in the presence of the king, right? The king did say that he could give up to half the kingdom, right? Now, be honest, ladies, men. If this were you and you were offered half of the kingdom, what would you ask for? What would you ask for? But step by step, Esther waited on God's direction. The excitement builds. Haman is thinking, yes, just me and the king and the queen, I must be special. He was delighted that he would now have a special meeting with the king and queen. And he's now thinking that he is being honored above everyone else. But not exactly. He was soon to find out that God had other plans. Proverbs 21 and 1 says, the heart of the king is in God's hand. And he turns it whichever way he wants. Now listen at this. The night before Esther's special banquet, 
King Xerxes had trouble sleeping, insomnia. Did that ever happen to any of y'all? So he thought a bedtime story would help. He ordered an attendant to bring the historical records. Sounds rather boring, but thinking perhaps he might fall asleep as the attendant read to him. Any of you ever pick up a book to read at night when you can't go to sleep? That sometimes helps. So the attendant is flipping through hundreds and hundreds of pages trying to decide what to read to the king. As God would have it, yes. Yes. the account of Mordecai's involvement in saving the king from assassination was read to Xerxes yes. that night. Yes. Yes. Xerxes has a flashback. The light bulb comes on. And Xerxes says, wait a minute, was Mordecai ever rewarded for that? The attendant replied, no. God has not forgotten. And again, as God would have it, at that very moment, who walks in but Haman? After he just heard the reminder. Now, Haman had come with this in mind tonight to request that Mordecai be hung on a specially built 75-foot hanging gallow. But the king had just been reminded of how Mordecai saved his life. Isn't God's timing amazing? Before Haman could get the words out, Xerxes asked him, Haman, what should I do to honor a man who truly pleases me? And here Haman goes again, full of pride, thinking that that special someone was himself. Your Highness, I think that royal robe should be placed on this person. This person should be placed on a royal horse. This wonderful man should be paraded around the city while the dignitary announces to the people, this is what happens to those the king wishes to honor. That's found in Esther 6 and 9 when you want to go back and read that. What an excellent idea, the king thought. So he instructed Haman to do all of this for who? Mordecai. Yeah. Haman was humiliated. So he tucked his tail, slithered out of the palace, went home and mourned with his family. So who's mourning now? Right? Later that evening, the king's servants arrived to take him to the banquet that Esther prepared. Dinner for three, but the tables have now turned. Here we are at the banquet. Esther reveals to King Xerxes Haman's e evil plot to kill Mordecai and the rest of the Jews. Immediately, Xerxes ordered Haman's execution. No questions asked, no explanation needed. And ironically, Haman was hung on the very gallows that he intended to use to hang Mordecai. The devil meant it for evil, but God, right? Have you all had any of those circumstances in your life? The devil meant it for evil, but God. So although the chief enemy of the Jews was dead, the threat was still present. The day was set aside for the mass slaughter of the Jews was approaching. The decree already signed by Haman had gone out to the entire kingdom. Swift action was needed to present, prevent a disaster. Esther appealed to the king for the right for Jews to protect themselves against those who would kill them. Scripture records that on that exact day that Haman had planned the Jewish extermination, the Jews killed 500 people in Susa alone, also Haman's 10 sons. The next day, they killed 300 more of their enemies in Susa, and total 75,000 enemies of the Jews were killed throughout the kingdom, thus assuring their safety in the kingdom. No weapon that is formed against you shall prosper. The weapon was formed. The weapon was formed. The plot was devised. The decree was signed, but God blocked it. He blocked it. The author of the book of Esther closes the book by emphasizing the greatness and future blessings of both Xerxes and Mordecai. Mordecai became prime minister, second in command behind the king. Mordecai. Esther 10.3b says this about Mordecai. He was very great among the Jews who held him in high esteem because he worked for the good of his people and was a friend at the royal court for all of them. Mordecai received the blessing of God because he was faithful to God's purposes and plans. Xerxes, who was a Gentile, received the blessing of God because he was friendly and protective towards God's specially chosen people. Yes. See how that works? Yes. Those connected to you will be blessed. Yes. The, story, the story of Esther and Mordecai can be used to teach many different lessons, some moral and some spiritual. But one primary lesson revolves around God's ability to use ordinary people to do extraordinary things. Yeah. Yeah. Esther and Mordecai were Jews in a foreign land, but God was able to use them because they both had good character, faith, 
and love towards God. True enough, Esther's beauty helped put her in position to be considered for queen, but it was her character and humility that gained the position. Yeah. Proverbs 31.30 says, Charm is deceptive and beauty is fleeting, on, but a woman who fears the Lord yeah. is yeah. to be praised. Yes. So again, God can work great things through ordinary people. In Esther, he works through a drunken husband's outrageous demand, a pagan beauty pageant, a villain's hateful and arrogant plot, a king's insomnia, a king's absent-mindedness, and a boring congressional record. He weaved, God weaved, all of those things together and redeems his nationally adopted people from destruction. God had a plan for Esther's and Mordecai's lives. And he used them by grafting together a historical tapestry that is the book of Esther. Yes. The tapestry of your lives, the good, the bad, yes. and the ugly. Yes. It's all working together. Yes. Romans 8.28 in the Amplified Version says, We are assured and know that God being a partner in our labor, all things work together and are fitting into a plan for good, both to and for those who love God and are called according to his design and purpose. Yes. Then Jeremiah 29, 11 reminds us, for I know the thoughts and plans that I have for you, says the Lord, thoughts and plans for welfare and peace and not for evil to give you hope and your final outcome. So looking at this story with our natural eye, we would be compelled to say, and rightfully so, that without Esther, Nehemiah would not have been able to rebuild the walls. Right. Without Esther, there would have been no Jewish nation. Right. Without the Jewish nation, there would have been no Messiah. Right. And without the Messiah, the world would be lost. Yes, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Unknown to the little orphan teenager, she helped to pave the way for Jesus Christ. Yeah. Now we understand that God had it all worked out. Nothing could put a stop to his plan for salvation. The point here is that Esther's purpose was intertwined with the coming of Jesus Christ, as was that of four more women, Tamar, Rahab, yes. Ruth, and yes. Bathsheba. Yes. Four more women who were ancestors in the lineage of Jesus Christ. Yes. So yes, Esther changed the course of history, and many of you will as well. That's just like a woman, yes. just like a woman, yes. right? Yes. Do you realize the power that you have, the kingdom principles equal power. There are so many examples of women in the Bible. We don't know all of their names, but we do know their stories. And your story is more important than a name, a title, or a license, yeah. right? So some of the powers that we possess, like the woman in Mark chapter 14, you have the power to do. This woman in Mark 14, she was denied public witness. She was denied her voice, but she still took a chance. She took radical action. She crashed the party where the men were gathered with Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. She then chose to act prophetically because the culture of the early first century Jerusalem did not allow her to speak prophetically. So she did what she could do. She broke open the alabaster box. Yeah. She broke open the alabaster box of expensive ointment and with the nurturing compassion that only a woman can possess, she anointed Jesus Christ, actually anointing him for burial. That's just like a woman. What she did was no small thing. Jesus himself said of this woman, of her experience, what she has done for me, this is Jesus, y'all. He said this, what she has done for me is one of good works. What she has done was within her power to do, and this woman's story shall be told forever. And then that's the power to do. And like the woman in Luke chapter 13, you have the power of freedom. This woman had been bent over for 18 years. Y'all hear me? 18 years. And here she was in church, unable to stand up under her own strength and power. Church was going on as usual, but she was being ignored. She had accepted her condition and said, oh, well, this is just a way of life for me. Everybody knows my past. They see my condition. This is just who I am. Then Jesus called her out loud, yes. in public. She didn't respond at first, I'm sure, because culturally this was a no-no. According to the rabbinic law of the times, it was strictly forbidden that a man give public recognition to a woman. But Jesus, being unorthodox as he often was, 
Aren't you glad? <laughs> he called her again. She stood there in front of Jesus. She recognized the voice, but she couldn't lift her head to see his face. But the sound of his voice carried an anointing that made her feel warm and it made her feel whole. But everyone was watching, waiting to see how she would respond. So in her worn down, tired, timid state, she still stayed bent over there in front of Jesus. Remembering that for 18 years, the community had labeled her as a cripple. And the neighborhood kids all called her the bent over woman. Can you imagine? Woman, Jesus said again, you are freed from your infirmities. You are set free from this disease. You are no longer bound. So here she is bent over, and then she says, oh, I'm healed. I'm free. She stood up. Hearing those words, spoken with the voice of power and authority, filled her heart and mind with new possibilities. They loosened the vicious pain of her bones and tissues and sinews that she had experienced for 18 years. This woman had the nerves to stand straight up. That's just like a woman. Having the nerves to get over your past. Choosing freedom over your bondage. Choosing wholeness over your brokenness. That's just like a woman. She released the negative thoughts and the mindset associated with the labels everyone had placed on her. For the first time in 18 years, she could see straight, up, straight ahead of her. She could look people straight in the eye. She stood tall and let onlookers know, I'm free now. I'm free now. I am not ashamed to show my face. That takes me to the scripture in Psalms 24. Lift up your head, O ye gates, and be ye lift up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your head, O ye gates, even lift them up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is the King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. The power of touch. So we've talked about the kingdom principles, the power to do, the power of freedom, and now the power of touch. Like the woman in Mark 5 who exhibited the power of touch, another unnamed woman labeled because of her issue. We all have issues of some sort. Hers happened to be a health issue, bleeding and hemorrhaging for 12 long years. Based upon the ancient purity laws in the 11th through 16th chapters of Leviticus, laws that were written over 500 years before this woman was born, this woman was considered dirty, unclean, and untouchable. Not that she wanted to be. The unclean person was always guilty. Now, unlike the earlier woman, this sister was banned from the church, excluded from society. She wasn't even supposed to be out in public. She was a victim of the oppressive religious and social systems, and she was ostracized by everyone. There was no such thing as doctor-patient confidentiality. Everyone in the community knew who she was and what she was all about. It was public knowledge that if you had been cursed with a blood taboo, the people were warned, don't touch her and don't let her touch you. Stay away. The word on the street was that she could not be cured because she displeased God. They knew her physical conditions, but they didn't take the time to notice her heart condition her soul condition. Man looks on the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. Can you imagine how she felt? Aside from the physical weakness, from the constant loss of blood, she was heartbroken from the loneliness and rejection, changing and washing her clothes over and over, day in and day out. Visualize it. Verbally and physically abused and suffering from low self-esteem. But on this morning, on this morning, she had an aha moment. A moment of desperation. She had heard that Jesus was in town for a revival. And just maybe, maybe if I cover my face so no one recognizes me, if I wrap up my body real good, if I sneak into the crowd, if I can just touch the hem or the fringes of his garment, he doesn't even have to touch me. If I can just touch the hem of his garment, I believe I can be healed. Slowly and cautiously, she edged her way through the crowd, positioned herself close enough to touch the bottom of Jesus' garment. Her touch of desperation became his touch of transformation. Immediately, the bleeding stopped. She took a chance. She said no to the purity laws and yes to her healing. That's just like a woman. You too have the power to touch Jesus for your needs. Amen? My final character witness... Y'all praying? 
my final character witness demonstrates another power that we have through our kingdom principles, the power of witnessing. This story is found in St. John, the fourth chapter. I like to call this a conversation at the water cooler. How many of you in corporate America, sometimes people say, meet me at the water fountain. When they want to talk about something they don't want nobody else to hear, they meet you at the water cooler. So this is a conversation at the water cooler. The story of the encounter between Jesus and the Samaritan woman, you mentioned earlier, <laughs> at Jacob's well. This story starts off with race relation issues. This is not a brand new crisis that just began. Race relation issues. The Samaritans were considered less than because of their mixed bloodlines. And the devout Jews would not associate or even talk with them. Now, Jacob's well was the spot for good water. It was known for its soft, cool, refreshing water. Tradition has it that this well was given to Jacob for the Israelites and their flocks to use only. Jacob's well had never gone dry. It represented a shrine to God's sustaining care and his giving power. Amen. Here it is noontime. Jesus and his disciples enter Samaria and arrive at Jacob's well. The disciples go into the city to buy food, and Jesus sits on the stone covering the well to rest. He was tired, weary, and thirsty in the heat of the day. But Jesus, he doesn't have anything to draw the water with. Now, morning and evening, when most of the villagers come to the well for the water, the sun is high. It was warm. But the Samaritan woman, unlike others who would not normally come at that time, she approaches the well at high noon. Yes. Right? Some say that she came at this time due to her lifestyle to avoid running into the other woman of the town who disliked her. But we know it was divinely orchestrated. Yeah. She sees Jesus, knows that he is a Jew. Jesus knows she is a Samaritan. So there is a little automatic tension, apprehension on the women's part. Jesus initiates a conversation with her which shocks her, first of all. Certainly no Jewish rabbi in his right mind would ever consider speaking to me, a woman and a Samaritan woman. Right. They were labeled immoral and promiscuous. Jesus spoke to her. Not only did he speak to her, he asked her for a drink of water. Jesus had overstepped all conventional bounds. Here, yeah. here he goes again. Here he goes again. Now, mind you, Samaritans, again, believed to be ritually impure, impure. The Jews would never share eating or drinking utensils with them. So unorthodox. But you know, Jesus never let tradition or law stand in the way of relationship. How is it that you, a Jew, ask me, a woman of Samaria, for a drink? We aren't friends. We don't share things. Jesus had already looked into her eyes, and he saw the hurt and sadness that she was dealing with. He forgot about his thirst and was drawn more to the woman's thirst, her deeper needs. If you only knew the free gift of God and who it is that's asking you for water, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water, water which gives eternal life, sir. How are you going to offer me living water? What do you have to draw with? The well is deep. Where's your bucket? Are you greater than Jacob who gave us this well? So now the barriers are lifted. Conversation is taking place. The difference in culture, the rules, the laws, everything is temporarily dismissed. The conversation continues. Jesus met this woman at her point of need, and he ministered life to her. Letting her know that if she accepts the living water that only he gives, she could stop searching for fulfillment and satisfaction and empty relationships, meaningless friendships, and things in trinkets that she lost interest in overnight. Her heart was ready. She says, sir, I'm ready. Give me this water you're talking about so I won't be thirsty again. Is there anybody in here that's thirsty for something more fulfilling? Right then and there. She left her water pots. She forgot about the well. She left her dead relationship. She left her past. She left it all with Jesus at the well. What are you willing to leave at the well today? What are you willing to leave at the well today? And she left in a hurry. She was on a mission heading for the city, carrying living water. And she ran the most successful revival heard of in those parts. Her text... Her sermon topic at every stop was, come see a man. Come see a man. And she talked to everybody she met. Now, that's just like a woman. Having the nerves to overcome by the words of your testimony. 
and leading others to Christ, telling them about Jesus Christ and how he can change your life. She was convincing because as she witnessed, the people followed her directives and went to see Jesus. The Bible says that numerous Samaritans believed and trusted and were saved because of what this woman declared and testified. They even asked Jesus to stay there for a two-day revival. And the Bible says that many more Samaritans were saved because of this a conversation at the water cooler between a Jew and a Samaritan. So what do you do, ladies? It's 2020, 2020, and you do know that you were made for such a time as this, right? Have you identified your privilege? Ask yourself, what are the challenges, the issues, the needs that I see around me? Mm -hmm. You've met the king just like Esther did. You've been empowered. Like the Samaritan women, you now have the living water, right? Satan has a plot to kill as many people as he can before they have a chance to repent and be saved. Are you witnessing to anybody? How many souls are added to the kingdom because of your testimony? There's bloodshed and hopelessness everywhere. Women and children are abused every day. You have hope. You have a word. You can bring people to Christ. God has called each of us for such a time as this. You are the generation that can make a difference. God has called you individually to change the destiny of homes and families and communities and churches all over the world. So as prophetic women, we can reclaim our voices, even if they have been submerged for years. Today can be your coming out party. Today can be your coming out party. Begin today to speak up, speak loudly, speak forthrightly. You have the answers. You can bring redemption to those who are thirsty. Second Chronicles 714 says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves, pray, seek my face and require of necessity my face in their lives and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven, forgive their sins and heal their land. That's just like a woman to believe that. Amen. Amen. Amen.